The best old time radio from people you trust. The Radio Nostalgia Network, where the oldies are still young. In the dream, you are falling, lost in the listening distance, as dark locks in. Go away from my window, go away from my door. Go away, way, way from my bedside and bother me no more. And bother me no more. I'll go tell all my brothers, I'll tell all my sisters too, that the reason why my heart is broke is all. Account of you is on account of. Why did I become friends with Mrs. Faulkner? Good question. Because we were neighbours, I suppose. May I introduce myself? Hilary Faulkner. I've just moved in next door. It wasn't as if we had much in common. She was twice my age. Over 70, she said. Time for a change, I told myself. My Arthur passed away a few months ago. She missed her husband, you could tell. But life goes on, doesn't it? I've got my children and grandchildren to think about. You know, the type, a bit old, a bit soft. But there was still something sparky about her. She wouldn't let things get her down. Anyway, the house next door had been empty for about a year. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? Nobody likes death. Not that kind. Then, Mrs. Faulkner came. Even I had to admit it was good to have a neighbour again. You know how isolated our two houses are. I was digging up some long, dead flowers in the garden a few days after she moved in. Do join me in a cup of tea, and you might do me a very small favour. I'm trying to open a jar of jam, but I've got a touch of arthritis in my hands. Could you possibly... She smiled in that persuasive way of hers. I went in and opened a jar of jam and that's how it started. Have a scone, dear. May I call you Christine? They were warm from the oven. My chest isn't too good. I don't like to go out in damp weather. It's very pleasant. There was something about her. She was sort of comforting to be with. She let you talk and really listened. I told her things I've never told anyone. But I didn't want to get too close. I always thought of her as Mrs. Faulkner, not Hillary. Kept that little distance between us. <laughs> All the same, I think you could say we were friends. She wasn't always putting herself forward, trying to impress you, not like some people. More tea? Mm. Please. You've made the house very nice. It was very nice when I moved in. Just a bit neglected round the edges from standing empty so long. I can't understand why such an attractive house didn't sell straight away. They didn't tell you? The estate agent explained about the isolated position. He did warn me, but I fell in love with it. I had to have it. It's very large for... Just for me, you mean. <laughs> I, I chose this town to be equidistant from all my children. I've got three, you know, and seven grandchildren. Yes, so I need a big house. There I go, talking too much about myself. Didn't they tell me what? It's nothing, really. Oh, come on, Christine. You've roused my curiosity now. Perhaps I shouldn't say. Well, is there something wrong with the house? No, nothing at all. Is it haunted? Oh, I'm not afraid of ghosts. There are no ghosts. What then? Someone died. Here? Not exactly. In the garden? On the road. On the hill that leads down to Thornton. A traffic accident? Oh, dear. Who was the person who died? Eleanor. She lived here. With her husband and little boy. How sad. A child needs its mother. Oh, so they moved away. Oh, Christine, you're trembling. Let me take your cup. What is it, dear? I'm sorry, I can't bear to talk about it. I'm stupid, aren't I? You must have been friends. How long had she lived here? Five years. A long time. Long enough. 
I felt shaken up inside being reminded like that. I told myself to forget about Elena, uh, about the Harrisons. I'd settled into a pattern of forgetting, but it was like twisting a kaleidoscope. A new pattern emerged and I couldn't find the old one again. I thought, how would it be if I could talk about it? It wouldn't change anything, but it would be an end. A full stop. Oh, Christine, it's you. Come in. I just put the kettle on. How are you today? Legs are a bit stiff. I saw Bellman's van. I asked them to deliver my groceries. I haven't got round to unpacking them yet. I'll help you. Oh, you're a godsend. He was a nice enough young man, mind you. Very chatty. Cornflakes in here? Uh, next to the sugar, dear. Do you know what he said? What? He said he wouldn't fancy living here. It's very quiet. Of course, everyone likes that. Then he asked me if I got nightmares. What about these biscuits? Rather an odd remark, don't you think? I'll put them on this shelf. They'll be easier for you to read. Why would I get nightmares, I wonder? I don't know. I've always slept very soundly. I'll put the washing up liquid by the sink. Christine, why was this house empty for so long? Not that again. Just as you like. The car crash. The one you told me about. Perhaps the young man was referring to that. Probably. It was in all the papers. It was an accident, wasn't it? I didn't say that. Arthur used to reckon I had only one weakness. My curiosity. You mean you're going to keep on at me until I tell you? I'm afraid it's a possibility. I, I did try to question the delivery man, but he, he was in a hurry. Ask anyone, he said. Everyone knows about the Harrison case around here. Then he drove off. I should take his advice, then. I don't get up much now. Uh, there's only you I can ask, Christine. <sighs> All right. It wasn't an accident. He messed about with Eleanor's car. The brakes failed and she was killed. He? Martin, Harrison, Eleanor's husband. I knew there was something. Let me get this straight. Eleanor was killed by her own husband. He's in prison for it. Are you satisfied now? Oh, oh I've got you. I've... No. Let me sit for a minute. Okay. Your hands are quite clammy. It knocks the stuffing out of you. I'm living in a house where a murderer once lived. He ate in this kitchen. He touched these taps, his worktop. Did he sleep in my bedroom? Don't. I'm 72 years old, and I don't think I've ever felt quite like this. It's, it's a shock, of course. But you know, it's rather exciting, too. You'd better tell me all about it. Is this a good idea, Miss Fawn? I'm probably the only person in this town who doesn't know the story, and I think I should. Like I told you, it seems Martin cut something on Eleanor's car. The brake pipe, I think. She went to see a friend every Tuesday, and there's this steep hill on the Thornton Road. I've heard about it. A real black spot. She died in hospital a day or two later. Martin was found guilty of murder, that's all. Imagine that. You're not upset? Good heavens, no. It's over now. Nothing to be done. And nothing to do with me, thank goodness. No, it's you I'm worried about. Me? What a terrible thing to happen right next door. You never had a chance to talk about it, have you? No. They say talking is the best therapy. I'm sure it's still a painful memory, isn't it? I've realised how much it helps to talk and to share things since Arthur passed away... Tell me about the Harrisons. I was curled up on Mrs. Faulkner's velvet sofa. I was warm, safe, full of tea and muffins. I was so comfortable except for this... ache. She could massage it away just by listening. I began to talk. I can remember the day Ellen and Martin moved in here. Oh, yes. I made a flask of coffee and some sandwiches and took them round, and there they were, Ellen and Martin, eating their lunch on an empty tea chest, French bread, pâté and a bottle of wine. She thanked me, but I felt stupid. That was Eleanor all over, she was terribly well organised, not like me. She was pregnant at the time and looked marvellous. What did she have? A boy. Ben. Short for Benedict. He was gorgeous. Poor child. We saw quite a lot of each other, Eleanor and me. Mainly here, in this house, it's sunnier than mine. Have you noticed? I would keep an eye on Ben while Eleanor got on, sewing or 
cooking. She was a fabulous cook. Each time I came, there seemed to be some improvement, something to admire, like these strip pine doors. She had lovely taste. I mean, our house is nicely decorated. John sees to that. Two rooms every year. He makes a very good job but of it. But Eleanor had style. That's something you're born with, isn't it? I never felt comfortable when she came round to our house. But it's a charming house. <laughs> I did try to make it nice at first. But it never quite came off, even when I copied one of Eleanor's ideas. And, of course, John didn't notice, so... I rather gave up on the house after a while. He and Martin were forever doing up old cars by that time. We hardly ever saw them. Eleanor and I used to laugh about it. Men are so childish, she would say. Give them food and love and a pleasant home and they're as happy as boys. They need a jolt now and then to get them out of their rut and make them realise they're grown-ups. What do you think? Well, I... She understood about men. I miss having a man about the house. And what did John think about it all? About what? The Harrisons. About Eleanor's husband. Oh, that. You don't mind my talking about it? No, I don't mind. He was stunned when Martin went to prison. They were good friends. John probably knew Martin as well as anyone, apart from Eleanor, of course. Didn't he notice something amiss? Do people commit murder on the spur of the moment? It must have been planned. Exactly. And John noticed nothing odd about him. Martin loved his wife. They seemed a normal, happy couple. Oh, dear. What is it? That makes it worse, doesn't it? I'm glad you've come to live here. How nice of you to say so, Christine. I realise now how much I hated living next door to an empty house. It frightened you? Sometimes. <laughs> I thought the house was breathing. Like a sleeping giant. One day it would wake up and... Good heavens! An empty house is more menacing than an occupied one. Why is that? I'm sure I don't know. I think it's because our imagination... Fills the spaces. Well, I'm afraid you've lost me, dear. I've too much imagination. That's what John always says. Head in the clouds, he tells me. He likes to keep his feet on the ground. Down to earth, that's him. <laughs> he doesn't believe in anything he can't touch. But there are other things. You can't touch them, but they're real. They live inside you, powerful things. People like John don't realise... I wish I was one of those balloons filled with helium. Let me go and I'd float away far up and I'd look down on all this. After all, what is there to keep me earthbound? It might have been different if we'd had children. What ever happened to the little boy? Ben. He lives with his grandmother. I miss him a lot. He was the image of Martin, not a bit like Eleanor. I suppose that's a shame because she was the one with the looks. It's all gone now, that beauty. Snuffed out. I used to babysit when Eleanor and Martin wanted to go to the theatre or dinner with friends. It was wonderful. Stories, games, everything I could think of way past Ben's bedtime. I'd bring crisps and lemonade round, but... <laughs> Eleanor never knew about that. Oh, how he loved them. I had to sweep up all the crumbs and salty bits off this carpet and rinse out his cup. Eleanor didn't believe in junk food. I suppose she was right. But I was only giving him a treat. Of course. I didn't do him any harm. I'm sure you didn't. I never see him now. In fact, I hardly saw him during that last year before Eleanor died. She didn't want me to look after him anymore. Why was that, dear? She joined a babysitting circle. Do you think she found out about the crisps? It wasn't that. Oh. Can't tell you the real reason. If you don't want... I really couldn't. I, I hope you don't think I'm no, crying. No, of course I don't. I, I'm, if I'm honest with myself, I have to say I find the Harrisons rather fascinating. The idea of a murder planned right here. Please. I'm sorry, that was tactless. Uh, it's all right. Perhaps we shouldn't talk about it. Oh, no, honestly, I don't mind. I, I'm sure it's done me good. I do hope so. It's done me good, too, having someone to talk to. Now, uh, tell me more about Eleanor. Why did I keep on seeing Mrs Faulkner? I told you, she listened. I think it became a kind of compulsion. Some people need drugs to feel right. I needed this contact, this... spilling of myself bit by bit into Mrs Faulkner's willing ears. 
excitement. Possibly. <laughs> we hedged round the nastiness of Eleanor's death, never dwelling on the broken limbs, the smashed face. I never saw Eleanor's body, but I've imagined it many times. I felt safe with Mrs. Faulkner. She held my hand while I trod on the thin ice of the past. I needed it. There wasn't much else in my life. Don't you find that time hangs heavy on your hands, Christine? I mean, no offence, but you haven't any children or even a job. I keep busy. And I have these chats to look forward to, Mrs. Faulkner. I've always needed something practical to do. Children give you that. You don't understand. I wanted children. That's why we bought such a big house. I've had all the tests. There's nothing wrong. We were just unlucky. What a shame for you. Still think of Eleanor. People must have thought she had all the luck. She seemed to have everything. And look what happened to her. She had everything. Was money a problem by any chance? Or did she have that too? We never seemed short of money, not like us. We've always had to scrimp on John's teaching salary. What did Martin do? Oh, he was the manager at a big garage, but he liked nothing better than getting his hands oily. And Eleanor stayed at home and looked after Ben? Quite right, I too. did have a job once, in a clothes shop in town, but I had to leave in the end. Too dreamy, they said. Unpunctual. I let the stock get in a mess and... The other girls upset me. In what way? They were crude. Always talking about... the sex and birth control and accidents and their insides. Terrible things. There were only dreadful things in the world. Nothing clean or good. It upset me. I can see it would. Uh, more tea, my dear. Thanks. Here, let me. This pot seems to be getting heavier every day. Is your arthritis worse? Just a bad patch. Be as right as rain in a few days. That fuss pot of the doctor wants to give me tablets and injections. You should have them. I'll, I'll manage. I can still move about. I'm just a bit slow, that's all. I hate to admit it, Christine, but I'm beginning to feel this house is too much for me. You're not thinking of moving? Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I would miss you. Well, don't you worry about me. Uh, why don't you finish off the gatto? You're so pale and thin, Christine. We can't have you wasting away. Pale and thin. I would lie there thinking about Mrs. Faulkner, all oblivious on the other side of our bedroom wall, probably snoring gently. Eventually I'd drift away. There was a lot of red in my dreams. Fire. Blood. Does that mean something? You should know. I woke sweating, terrified I'd somehow infected her dreams. What do they call it? Telepathy, isn't it? Is there such a thing? I half wanted her to share my terrors. It would make a kind of bond between us. Each session together became precious. Even if it desperate. Would I be able to spill myself out before she went? Would she ever understand me? I felt if anybody could, it would be Mrs. Faulkner. I've had a letter from my daughter. Listen to this. She's going to have an extension built, she says. A, a sort of granny flat, but all on the ground floor to save my legs. Look, she's, she's drawn a diagram. You're going there. I'll be near my grandchildren, but independent too, I insisted on that. How long? Oh, a few months yet. That nice Mr. Hargreaves from the estate agents is coming to value the house tomorrow. Don't look so worried, Christine. You'll soon have some new neighbours, a family perhaps, and someone you can be friends with, like you were with Eleanor. No. That reminds me. Bellman sent my groceries this morning. Do you know that delivery boy is a font of knowledge? He told me. What? Martin Harrison is being moved to a different prison. Somewhere more lenient, he said. How gossip gets round in a small but town. But shouldn't a man who murdered his wife be kept somewhere safe? What if he escaped? They must be sure he isn't a danger to anyone. Most murders are domestic, aren't they? Jealousy. What, dear? It was jealousy. It often is. I know it was. How can you be sure? It must have been. Was she meeting other men? I... 
don't want to talk about it. I'm sorry. I, I must go. Um, lots to do. Busy. Um, very busy. But your tea? I wanted to tell her why couldn't I? She would understand how dreadful it had been. I went home. I sat on the floor of my kitchen. And I spoke aloud, just as if Mrs Faulkner was there. <sighs> Mrs Faulkner. It was one afternoon, Mrs Faulkner, about a year before she died. Yes, dear. I popped around as usual and found the door locked. Eleanor never locked her door. I knew she was in. Her car was outside and I could hear Ben singing away to himself in his cot upstairs. Then I noticed the front room curtains. They were drawn, but not very carefully. I peered through the gap and saw Eleanor sprawled on the carpet with a man. It wasn't Martin. Her dress was pulled right up and she was wearing black stockings. Like a fool, I just stared. Eleanor saw me. You see, Mrs Faulkner, she looked at me quite coolly and then she began to smile. Poor Christine, what on earth did you do? I backed away from the window. I remember feeling angry. Why couldn't she pull her curtains properly? My cheeks were burning as I ran home. It was me who felt guilty. And that's why you fell out with Eleanor. I kept thinking, how could you? Disgusting, disgusting with some stranger. And Ben, upstairs, that was the worst thing. If people can't look after their children, they shouldn't have them. I quite agree. I didn't go round anymore. She got other people to look after Ben. We can't impose on you any longer, she said. I've joined a babysitting circle. Why should I be punished? Then I began thinking. What? I'd hardly seen him. Just a head, a back, a white shirt. I knew it wasn't Martin. He's got fair hair. This man was dark. Like John. John wore a white shirt that day. And I checked his timetable. A double free period that afternoon. Then I knew. No wonder she was so pally. No wonder he didn't talk to me anymore. But she already had everything. Why did she have to take what was mine? So much unhappiness. Then something funny happened. The less I saw of Eleanor, the more oppressed by her I became. And that was when John started getting at me about the state of the house. So much unhappiness. I never told him that I knew. We went on as usual. It might have been somebody else. You can't be sure. I told myself that often. But in my heart, I knew. They treated me as though I wasn't there. Oh. I got up off the floor to answer the phone. It's Hilary Faulkner, dear. But it... Are you all right? Yes. I was worried about you going off suddenly like that. I'm all right now. It was true... I felt calmer, I had more energy. I felt she understood me better. We were closer. I had to keep seeing her. To keep spilling out the truth in drops. Oh dear. Let me cut the cake. Another bought one, I'm afraid. I can't bake any more with these silly stiff fingers of mine. From now on, I'll make something and bring it round. But you don't like cooking. I can be practical, you know. When I need to be. When there's a purpose in it. Well, that's a kind offer. That, if you're sure... Quite sure. You've restored my faith. Oh, has something happened? Well, I got my meat delivered this morning from that butcher's on Field Street. And do you know, both the braising steak and the mince were short weight. Wickedness is rife. That's what the judge said at the trial. At Martin Harrison's trial? Yes. I thought... I mean, no, no, I, I won't ask. I, I don't want you getting upset again. I wasn't upset. All the same, I, I think we should avoid the subject. There's no need. You know it does me good to talk about it. Talking is the best therapy. That's what you've said. I'm not sure. Well, if you don't want to know about it. The trial? Oh, of course I'd like to hear. I had no idea you were there. Didn't you find it awfully distressing? I had to go. I was a witness. No. It's true. My evidence was important. You could say it helped to convict Martin. I'm not sure I want to hear this after all. Now, you're not... I heard them your... arguing the night before it happened. It was a terrible row. They were shouting and screaming at each other. He must have found out about her. Found out what? About her men. She was shameless. Didn't I tell you about that? I thought I had. 
Of course I did. Last week, you remember? And the day after their row? He killed her. I had to tell the truth, didn't I? Of course. The worst part was before the trial. All the questions. The police? There was one, Inspector Molyneux, he was called. He had no feelings, no sensitivity. Do you know what he did? He searched our shed. They didn't suspect John. Yes, Inspector Molyneux didn't care how much he upset me. Endless questions at home, at the police station, John and me together, then separately. A waste of time and money. They knew it was Martin. Because of the row they had. That, plus the fact they found his overalls buried in the garden. They had brake fluid on them. There were traces of fluid on the secretaries in his shed too. It all came out at the trial. And now little Ben has no mother. And his father is a convicted man. Murderer. Oh, the sadness of it. It's terrible. Don't, Mrs. Faulkner. It's all over now. Here. Oh, thank you, dear. It's a sort of compulsion, isn't it? This desire to talk about dreadful things, like the girls in your shop. Perhaps we're just as bad. No, it's not the same. Surely it's not. Well, you've got it off your chest now. Quite honestly, Christine, I think the best thing is to put it behind you and start forgetting. Do you think so? No more talk of Eleanor Harrison. It's finished. Agreed? All right. It's finished. No more talk of Eleanor. But I was nearly empty, just a few drops left. I went home feeling cheated. I wandered about aimlessly, wishing I was back in front of Mrs. Faulkner's electric fire, soaking up the waves of warmth, easing the... Ache. I remembered other lonely afternoons. I remembered being aware of Eleanor's presence beyond the wall. Sometimes her friends came and I could hear them laughing. But there had been a time when I was welcome. Even to her dinner parties. They were relaxed, stylish affairs I couldn't hope to imitate. And afterwards, John would ask, Why couldn't I cook like Eleanor? Why didn't I tart myself up a bit like Eleanor did? Sometimes my head felt like it would burst when he went on at me like that. And then I found them sprawled on the floor together. <laughs> oh. I spoke aloud as though Mrs. Faulkner was sitting opposite me, nodding and smiling, encouraging me to go on. She had it all, you see, Mrs. Faulkner. Martin's love and little Ben. Her beauty and a smart home. So much unhappiness. But she wanted more. And she took it. Never mind my feelings, I had no existence in her eyes. I wasn't important. She took John. Are you sure you aren't imagining this? Then she took the child from me. I love Ben. I know he loved me. Of course he did. It was your fault, Eleanor. You made me jealous. I thought you liked me. I thought we were friends, but you used me. You wanted John and our friendship counted for nothing. Perhaps it never had any meaning. Perhaps I was always the sounding board for your many perfections. When you stopped letting me play with Ben, I began. She used you. You corrupted my friendship into envy. You were so smug, so prosperous. You sucked me dry. You fed on me like a leech. She sucked you dry. You were all substance and I was a shadow. <gasps> I caught sight of myself in a mirror. My face was drained of colour. Drained of everything. Except disgust. I just wanted to give you a jolt. Make you feel a bit of pain. I didn't mean to kill you. <laughs> With one blow, I smashed it. Fragments of silvered glass tumbled to the floor. You hated her that much? Hate? How could I hate Eleanor? Perfection is to be admired, not hated. But it had to go somewhere, all that feeling. Blowing me up, weighing me down until I was a balloon filled with lead. I understand now. You understand, yes. Yes. She made me hate myself. <laughs> Are you still there, Miss? Mrs. Faulkner. I'm here. Don't go. <laughs> Did you know that broken glass is beautiful? <laughs> like cracked eyes. <laughs> what about the car, Christine? 
before that. Oh, it was easy. John had borrowed one of Martin's car manuals the weekend before I stayed up late, studied the diagrams, saw where I could cut the flexible brake pipe. I'd heard about such things. Men talk as though women are incapable of understanding. I did it in the morning while Eleanor took Ben for a walk. I wore Martin's overalls and used his secateurs. The Harrisons never locked their shed. She went to see a friend every Tuesday while Ben was at playgroup. There's this steep hill. What about the row they had the night before? There was no row. John was out at a parents' evening, so it was Martin's word against mine. I got away with it. I'm not always in a dream. I can think and plan if I want to, if I really want to. Eleanor couldn't have done it better. You killed her. I didn't mean to. And the boy? I'm sorry about Ben. Afterwards, I had a wild idea we could adopt him. John soon put an end to that. Does John know what you did? I doubt it. He hasn't the imagination. You're the only one who knows, Mrs. Faulkner. Inspector Molyneux with his hard face and his endless questions, he couldn't get it out of me. You don't hate me. I've told you because I thought you'd understand. I had to tell someone. It was too much to carry alone. It's always better to share things, isn't it, Mrs. Faulkner? Isn't it? Mrs. Faulkner? Mrs. Faulkner? There was no answer. I crumpled to the floor and lay there a long time. Eventually I went upstairs to the bathroom. But the mirror reflected a ghost. I smashed that too. It took ages to clear up all the broken glass. It gave me something to do. The pieces of mirror were like flints. Razor sharp, I cut my fingers several times. Tiny splits that sprouted blood. Before I fetched my gardening gloves. I threw the shards into the dustbin. They made a noise to wake the neighbourhood. Only there's no one else in our neighbourhood. Just Mrs. Faulkner and me. She didn't come back until night. I was waiting for her. Lying stiff and straight in my bed. Are you there, Mrs. Faulkner? What about Ben? He's safe with his granny. The child needs its mother. I know. You killed her. There were reasons. She pushed me. I thought you understood. What about the row they had? What about the car? Why did you hate her so much? I thought I explained. It was me. I'm no good. I know that. I destroyed her. I should have destroyed myself. Forgive me. That traffic accident. I'm sorry. You planned it in cold blood. Don't go. Come back. Where are you? What shall I do? I can't hear you. Shall I tell? No, don't tell. I only wanted you to know. You understand me, don't you? Poor child. Hold me. Only five years old. I never meant to harm you. You took his mother. No. A child needs its mother. Don't tell anyone. Poor child. I know, I know. Mrs. Faulkner, speak to me. Next day I went for a walk. The sky was thin and clear and far away I felt empty and light. I walked to the top of the hill above Thornton. I thought, if only I could run fast enough, I could probably take off and fly up into that glassy dome. <laughs> of course I fell over. I didn't care, nothing mattered now. I had told someone. I'll go tell all my brothers. I'll tell all my sisters... I had told her, hadn't I? She had spoken to me. 
She must have, or how could I feel so different, so unburdened? After that, I liked to sit at her feet and rub the swollen joints when they hurt her. I made her meringues and brandy snaps and filled them with cream. Mm, delicious. Have another one. Oh, Christine, I mustn't. I'm having another one. Well, you've nothing to worry about. In fact, I think you're thinner than ever. Any less of you and you'll be a shadow. Shadows can be strong. What, here? I was a ghost once. Oh, you're talking about my head again. You know what I mean. Do I? You know everything. Now you are flattering me. She smiled, but I thought I saw a touch of steel in her blue eyes. Was she playing some sort of game? What did she really think of me? Oh, uh, would you massage my shoulders for me now, dear? Of course. Oh, oh. oh. it's uh, such a relief. Oh. Oh. <coughs> oh. More. Please. I massaged her pain away. Her body, despite its bulk, was quite frail. Under all that flesh, there was no strength in her. Oh, thank you. That's much better. Anything else? You made me sound like a hard taskmaster. Well, since you ask, a, a fresh pot of tea would be lovely. The more I did, the more she seemed to want. The blue eyes watched me, piercing my thoughts. There was a subtle balance of power between us. Then it tipped and I began to slide down. She knew everything. She might keep it to herself and let me pander to her. Or she might tell someone. Inspector Molyneux, perhaps. Each day I waited for the doorbell to ring, a policeman on the doorstep, but no one came. She was biding her time. At night I whispered to her through the wall, What are you going to do? I haven't decided yet. You're enjoying this, aren't you? What do you mean? You've got me where you want me. I'm like a rabbit caught in your headlights. Shall I run you over? It's up to you. You destroyed her. I didn't mean to. Are you sure about it that? It was an accident. Accidentally on purpose, naughty girl. <sighs> Don't tell. You're so pale and thin, Christine. Like a shadow. You'll waste away. I'll come back and haunt you. I don't believe in ghosts. Wickedness is rife. That's what the judge said. All right, punish me. Do it. Tell someone. But don't leave me like this. Not knowing. I haven't decided yet. Then one night, it came to me. For the first time since I looked in that car manual and saw a way to make Eleanor suffer, I felt substantial. I knew what I had to do. After John left for work, I got what I needed and set off down Crab Lane. It's not far into town. I went into the butchers on Field Street and remembered to make a scene. And played loudly. Make sure it's full weight, if you don't mind. There's a narrow alley off Field Street. It peters out into a rough path, and soon after that, it's very overgrown. I carried on down the thorny path. It's rarely used. I don't think many people know about it. It goes along the back of our houses in Crab Lane. There are some loose slats in Mrs. Faulkner's fence. They moved easily, and I squeezed through. Crouching, I ran the length of the garden. I stopped at the back door, opened it. I took the long nylon scarf, which always hung there, and edged into the kitchen. It was empty. Afterwards, I would mess the place up, make it look like burglars. The hall was deserted, too. Where are you, Mrs. Faulkner? Upstairs. No. In the living room, I think. I pulled the scarf taut in my hands, used my elbow to open the door. The handle came up smoothly without a click. How well I knew that house. Better than my own. I went in. She was sitting in an armchair half turned from me, staring out of the front window. I stood quite still. A ripple, almost a laugh, came up in my throat. She was too stiff to move quickly, too weak to fight. If I crept round behind her, she need never know. Perhaps I wanted her to know. To acknowledge I too had power and knew how to use it. What do you think? Anyway, I hesitated a moment too long. 
She turned round, smiling when she saw me. Oh, Christine, have you come to help me with the packing? How kind. I've been sitting here listening to the radio, thinking how lucky I've been to have lived in this house, if only for a short while, and have had such a good neighbour. I've treasured our meetings, and I, I just wanted you to know that. Sometimes these things don't get said, and you regret it. Would you give me a hand up, my dear? Oh, thank you. Oh, is that my scarf? I must have dropped it in the hall. I'll hang it up later. Now, where shall we start? Do you know, Christine, you look paler than ever. Now, promise me you'll get out in the sunshine more often. Was there something you wanted to tell me? I've told you. You have? Oh, I must be getting deaf as well. Everything. What, dear? You know. Whatever it is, I'm afraid I've forgotten. Perhaps you'd like to remind me while I sort through the china. I, I really ought to make a start. The teachers are coming tomorrow and I, I can't take everything. Forgotten? About Eleanor and Martin, the trial, the police, you've forgotten. No, I remember all that, but we agreed it was too upsetting to talk about. It, it's nothing to do with either of us, not anymore. You weren't listening. Of course I was, dear. But you didn't hear me. At night, through the walls. Not a sound. I always sleep like a log. You mean I imagined it? Oh, it sounds like it. I'd like you to have these plates, Christine. They were my mother's. Here you are, dear. Oh. It's still inside me. Like a stone, like a stillborn child. Don't be upset. It was just an accident. Accidentally on purpose. But they were my mother's. Can't carry it any longer. It's too heavy. Sometimes I don't understand you, Christine. I went home and phoned the police. <laughs> I like Mrs. Faulkner. Perhaps she was the only person I ever really liked. But that was the idea, wasn't it? Who planted her next door? Was it you? Or was it Inspector Molyneux? Yes. He knew all along, didn't he? And bother me no more. His mother, I suppose, of course, she must have been. She must have been a Mrs. Molyneux before she married Arthur. <laughs> she was a good listener, I'll give her that. Nearly as good as you, Doctor. I shall miss those cosy afternoons. But perhaps she never really liked me at all. Perhaps it was all an act. Another reason why my heart is broke is on account of you. Just wait, Mrs. Faulkner. Just wait till I get out of here. I'll go tell all my brothers, tell all my sisters too. Now the reason why my heart is broke is on account of you, is on account of you. Maureen O'Brien played Christine and Margot Boyd, Mrs. Faulkner, in Black Stockings and Broken Mirrors, by Bernadette Crosthwaite. Go Away From My Window was sung by Melanie Hudson and the director was Martin Jenkins. <laughs>